Hello, this is Jenna Nichols. Today we're going to talk about structure 3.1.3, which is all about periodicity, the trends and properties of elements across a period and down in group. Okay, so the term periodicity refers to a repetition of properties when we're comparing elements um, as they go across a periodic table. So when you go across like this, effectively, Every time you go down to a new row, the same pattern repeats itself. So you get to the end, you go down, the pattern starts over again. Um, so that is the basis of periodicity because it follows the periods, the rows on the periodic table. Um, and then um, you will also start to see some patterns when you're looking at elements that are in the same group because elements in the same group will have typically the very similar chemical properties due to the fact that they have the same number of valence electrons. So we're going to look at um, patterns today on atomic radius, ionic radius, melting point, um, ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity. Okay, I want to just take a moment and point out all of the resources that are available in the data booklet that relates to periodicity because there's quite a lot. Um, so section seven is the general periodic table. That is the normal one with the atomic number, the um, average atomic mass. So that's the normal periodic table. Then in section eight, you have values on melting point and boiling point. I'm abbreviating here to make it simple. Um, so melting point and boiling points in section eight. Um, and that's at standard pressure. Section nine, you have first ionization energies electron affinities and electron negativities all in the same periodic table um, which is super useful for this section in particular and then um, in section 10 of the data booklet you have another periodic table that lists um, atomic radius and uh, most common ion radius uh, so because you have all this information for so many of the elements it's never enough to just know the pattern because you can just look it up, all right? And so it's not really worth your time memorizing, like, oh, this increases as you go across and decreases as you go down. Um, you need to be able to explain why those trends exist. Um, and so we're going to look at that uh, in the next few sections. All right, let's start with melting point. Um, melting point is interesting. So you'll have, you're starting out the periodic table of hydrogen, um, which is a gas at room temperature. So you have these really low melting points, all right? Um, and then as you start you know, going across the periodic table, then you get to carbon, all right? And solid carbon in its standard state is going to be something like um, graphite or diamond, one of those allotropes of solid carbon, um, very high melting point. But then when you get to nitrogen, the next element over, it goes back down dramatically. Um, because that's what we are going from these giant covalent or network covalent um, back down to molecular because nitrogen N2 is a molecular compound it's um, a gas at room temperature and so then you, you keep going neons even the gas you start going up and so you get to silicon again it can form those giant covalent typically with oxygen as well but um, it's going to be a little bit less than carbon but you're still going to see that massive drop between silicon and then phosphorus as the next element. Oops. And so it kind of follows this pattern as you go across because of the nature of bonding. Now, um, let's look at group patterns. This is my very generic periodic table. Um, so when you have, when you're looking at the metals and particularly group one and two metals, as you go down, the melting point is going to, going to actually get lower as you go down. Um, and that's because the atomic radius increases. So these elements are getting larger and larger. And so that makes the Coulombic attractions um, between the metal ions and the delocalized valence electrons those Coulombic attractions gets weaker because of the further distance away. So you have a lower melting point, the larger the element for metals. Okay. When you're looking at the non-metals and you're going down a group, 
those nonmetals, the melting point actually increases as you go down a group. And that's because um, when you're looking at nonmetals, you're dealing with intermolecular forces instead of metallic bonding. So intermolecular forces. You're going to have stronger intermolecular forces when there are more total electrons present. They have a larger cloud of electrons, total cloud, so it becomes more polarizable and it will have stronger London dispersion forces. Those stronger forces require more energy to break. So nonmetals have a higher melting point the further you go down. Metals have a lower melting point the further you go down. Um, so when you're dealing with a group, you want to look at whether it's metals or nonmetals and the type of interactions. But when you're looking at across a period, there's going to be a change in the type of bonding as you're going across. OK, so now when we're talking about atomic radius, you really want to distinguish between um, period trends and group trends. As you go down a group, the atoms will get larger, they have a larger radius, and that's because they have more energy levels. So the um, outermost energy level is further away from the nucleus, has a larger radius. Um, so always check that first when you're looking at the patterns, so the number of energy levels. Then you want to look at, okay, as you go across a period, there are more protons, but the same number of energy levels. Energy levels. And since there are more protons, it's going to have a greater attraction to the outermost energy level. So the more protons it has with the same number of energy levels, the smaller the radius. Because that greater nuclear charge pulls the electrons closer to the nucleus. And so that's how you get that trend for atomic radius. Ionic radius is just a little more involved than atomic radius because we need to look at whether it's forming a cation or an anion. A cation is a positive ion and um, it forms when they lose electrons, when an atom loses electrons. Um, so typically cations are going to be smaller than the neutral atom because you, you're losing electrons. Neutral. Anions or negative ions, they have to gain electrons, and so they will be typically larger than the neutral atom. Um, a couple of little things that you want to kind of pay attention to. If the cation um, causes it to lose an energy level altogether, so it might have fewer energy levels, which makes it much smaller. Um, like, for example, if you have sodium, sodium forming an ion, um, will be losing its outermost S electron. Um, and so it will just have um, the electron configuration of a neon and just have those two energy levels compared with three energy levels for a neutral sodium atom. So that's something to pay attention to for cations. And then for anions, um, when you're gaining electrons, you're going to have more electron-electron repulsions. And so that's going to spread them out and cause the radius to get larger. All right, our next trend is an ionization energy, and that's the energy required to remove an electron from the gaseous state, um, from an atom in the gaseous state. And you so see, you can have a first ionization energy, a second ionization energy, et cetera, et cetera, um, based on the number of total electrons that you have in the atom. The first one is always going to be the easiest to remove, take the less, least amount of energy of the set, um, and then it'll kind of go up from there. So, the pattern really on the periodic table, just draw my little generic periodic table. My drawings keep getting worse and worse the more often I draw them. <laughs> um, but effectively, when you are going across a period, okay, so across a period, we already talked about this, they have more protons, but the same number of energy levels. But if you have more protons, it has a greater attraction to those electrons in the outermost energy level. And if there's a greater attraction, it's going to require more energy to remove. So when you're comparing elements in the same period, um, you're looking at the number of protons, more protons, more energy to remove the electrons. So that's for a period. When you're looking at a group, you're looking at the number of energy levels. So you're going to have more energy levels. Oops, weird arrow. 
more energy levels. That means that the protons are a greater distance from the, from the valence electrons. And the further away it is, the easier it is for it to remove. So as you go down a group, it takes less energy to remove that first electron because the Coulombic attractions of the protons to the valence electrons are fewer because it's a greater distance away. Okay, so electron affinity is effectively the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy um, is always an endothermic process because it requires an input of energy to break the bond between the nucleus and the electron that's being removed. Okay. Um, electron affinity is the reverse. So it's when an atom is gaining an electron. What is the energy change there? Um, and in some cases, you will have a um, positive value. In some cases, you'll have a negative value. And really, the more negative the electron affinity, the more the atom is attracting electrons. Okay, so more negative, more negative is equal to more attractive. So sometimes you'll find that people refer to electron affinity as like the um, the absolute value. So it has a greater affinity, it means it's a more negative value. Um, but you're going to see a lot of the same trends that we've been looking at before. All right. Um, for the most part, as it is going across a period, um, because it has the same energy levels, but a greater number of protons, it's going to attract electrons better. Um, and the exception there is going to be the uh, noble gases. There we go, because uh, noble gases already have a full um, full energy level, so it's much less likely for it to want to gain an electron. Um, it would have to add it to a whole new energy level. Uh, so that would be further from the nucleus, and it would make it a lot less likely to happen. Um, so up until the noble gases, it's going to increase as you go across because there's more protons. They can attract the negative electrons better. When you're dealing with a group, however, you're going to have more energy levels. Um, so the proton, it, the protons in the nucleus are further away um, from the valence shell, which is where the electron would need to be added. And so since it's further away, the coulombic attractions are weaker, and so it will not attract electrons as well. So less attraction. to outside electrons. And so that's kind of your pattern for electron affinity. Okay, so our last trend that we'll talk about is electronegativity. And this is very, very similar to electron affinity. The only difference really is electronegativity is when you're comparing atoms that are in a bond chemically bound together, how well are they attracting electrons in a bond? Um, but it's going to follow that same pattern and for the same reasons. Um, as you go across a period, with the exception of the noble gases, um, it's going to increase in electronegativity because you have more protons, but the same number of energy levels. Um, so those protons can exert um, a, the, a greater attraction. When you have more protons, there's a greater attraction um, for electrons in a bond. Um, when you're comparing elements in a group, however, you have um, more energy levels. And when you have more energy levels, there is a greater distance between the um, protons and the valence shell. So that greater distance um, means that there is weaker attractions to electrons in the bond. So you'll have a lower um, electronegativity value. Okay, so for this example question, we need to write equations illustrating the first ionization energy and first electron affinity of hydrogen. Um, so we're going to deal with gases for both of them, because that's part of the definition for ionization or electron affinity. And um, for ionization energy, that's for losing an electron. So we're going to be left with a positive hydrogen ion and a free electron. 
Okay. Whereas electron affinity is effectively the reverse. Um, but we're starting with, again, the neutral gas. We're going to gain an electron to form negative hydrogen ion like this. And so this one is an endothermic process. It requires energy to break the bond between the hydrogen and its electron. Um, whereas electron affinity is going to be an exothermic, um, so negative. And um, that's because you are forming a new bond between the hydrogen and an extra electron. OK, so for this example, um, explain why the radius of hydride, which is H negative, is larger than the radius of a neutral hydrogen atom. Um, and that's so if I look at the electron configuration, if it's a neutral hydrogen atom, it's just 1s1, it's just one proton, one electron. But if I have hydride, it's gained an electron to fill up its energy level, so that's 1s2. They still have the same number of energy levels, same number of protons. They will have one proton, that's what makes it hydrogen. So the extra electron there um, it makes it larger because of electron-electron repulsions. If you had like an extra energy level um, or something else going on, you could talk about that. But in this case, the only thing difference is the number of electrons in that orbital. And so since there's more electrons in the orbital, they repel each other more, which gives it a larger radius.